month on Quest. Sex, drugs and rock and roll. Well, rock and roll anyway. Join me as I delve into the music that changed the world. The attitude, the icons and the lifestyle. Coming up, we've got Shock Rock with the lovable Alice Cooper. Serious stuff with confessions from Motley Crue's Nikki Six. We had girls, everybody was smashed, we were loud, we were obnoxious, and we were having a blast. The legendary guitar man Les Paul, who's still performing at 92. And movies to music, a touch of anarchy. It's Juliet Lewis. There are plenty of places where I could have started this program, but I decided there was only really one place that I must begin this journey into rock and roll. This is Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee, the home, of course, of Elvis Presley. Probably the first, the original, and perhaps today still the biggest icon of rock and roll. August the 16th, 1977. The day the king died. For these fans at least. Despite record-breaking temperatures well over 100, thousands of people have made the pilgrimage to Memphis to celebrate this special 30th anniversary. Do your friends and family think you're mad coming Absolutely. all the way from Australia to here? Crazy. So why do you do it? Because he's worth it. We love him. 30 years ago he died. No, but he, he lives to today. He lives in the heart of everybody. If you think 30 years is a long time to cherish the memory, it comes as no surprise to Elvis's lifelong friend, Jerry Schilling. Why has his legacy lasted so long? First of all, he was a consummate artist. He left us a body of work, probably the greatest singer of all time probably the most underrated producer of all time, of music. If you look at Elvis Presley's discography, it's not about rock and roll, it's not about country, it's not about gospel, it's not about... He knew where to pick a good song from anywhere. He also had some way of delivery that I can't totally explain, but with people who were in New Delhi, India, or South Africa, they felt he was singing that song to them. When he sang a song, he sang it to me. And he meant every word of it, and he was sincere, he was honest, um, and he sweat a lot for me, so I'm gonna sit here and sweat a lot for him. And his music said, come along, we're gonna have the fun. Jump on my bandwagon, we'll have a nice long ride. What can we say has been his legacy to rock and roll? Kicking in the door and starting it, you know, there, there's a lot that you can say, and there was a lot of contribution to the beginning of rock and roll, but if you had to pick one moment, one thing, you got to pick when he walked into Sam Phillips' studio at Sun Records. It was the start. That was the start. 50 years ago, a young Elvis Presley came to record his first song. No one could have known what was going to happen, but within two years, Presley was one of the most famous names in the world, and with rock and roll, the face of music had changed forever. From the deeply conservative South, Elvis emerged as the first of the rock and roll rebels. He has influenced all those that followed, and has been described as the greatest cultural force of the 20th century. In the three decades since his death, despite the stories of scandal and more, his music continues to attract new generations of fans. His liberating spirit lives on in a wiggle of the hips and a shifting of those feet. The white community had not been exposed to black music. And Elvis crossed the line, became within a week a sensation here in Memphis. And it was, it was exciting. It wasn't like anything you were used to hearing. 
The culmination of the Elvis Memorial Week has always been the candlelight vigil. As night draws in on the eve of the day that Elvis died, an estimated 75,000 people are waiting for their turn to walk past his grave. Rock and roll creates enduring legends, but you don't need to tell that to the fans at Graceland's tonight. For them, well, it's really very simple. The King lives on. In Memphis, I saw at first hand the power of rock and roll. But I still can't put my finger on the nature of the actual music. We all think we know it when we hear it, but this is the place to truly discover. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Guiding me through the museum's 18,000 artifacts is the chief executive and historian, Terry Stewart. Some people like guitars, some like costumes, some like looking at the original lyrics where the words are crossed out. There's a little bit of everything here. Ask any youngster and they think rock and roll began with their generation, don't they? Oh yeah, we hear that every day and uh, part of what we do here is try to explain to them through the exhibits and our programs that it's a much older coming together of many forces and genres of music. <laughs> After the slaves come to America, you move forward into ragtime, which really finds sort of a crazy syncopation. Then you move into jazz and blues. Boogie Woogie, which comes out of the but Texas. that's not rock and roll. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Absolutely. It is not just a skinny white kid with no shirt, long hair, and a loud guitar. It's a lot more than that. It's really something that's almost impossible to define. And that's why here at the museum, we, we aggravate a lot of people because they all come in with their own definition. What I can tell them is where all the pieces came from and how it came together. Does it stand for anarchy? At times, sure. The breakdown of society as you know it. Does it stand for rebellion? Absolutely. And yet at some point, those in rebellion become in the majority. And then it becomes jaded and, it, and all the edges are rounded off. And somebody says, hey, you old farts, you can't do that. Here's the way you got to do it. And ergo, the rise of things like punk music or hip hop. Those are all reactions to what was in place at the time. Rock and roll and its origins is far more complicated than I had imagined. In many ways, it is more easily defined by what it stands for. It's about a beat. It's about an attitude. Uh, it's about a, a lifestyle in some ways. It's an, it's an approach to music that was iconoclastic. It was something that broke down the barriers. There are no rules, you know, between tempo, key signatures, er, you know, everything. It's just however you wanted to make the music is how it happened. Amazing. I've really enjoyed this. When we return, I hop on board the bandwagon of Alice Cooper. <laughs> and I explore the magic of a catchy guitar riff. Yes, that one. 